this year we're back with our predicted AQA A-level psychology papers and video walkthroughs. Laura, our head of psychology, has looked at the trends and patterns that have come up in the past. She's done an analysis of the topics and questions that have appeared in previous exam seasons and has used this to write psychology predicted papers for this year. Now follow the link in the description below and this will take you to all the predicted papers that we have available. In addition to this, she's done video walkthroughs of all three papers so you can see what a top mark band answer looks like in psychology. These will also talk you through the skills you'll need to interpret the questions and know how to structure your answers. For paper three, issues and options in psychology, there are questions and walkthroughs for all of the optional topics. We've not limited it to just a selection or the most popular like some revision resources do. Whichever three topics you have prepared for and been taught, there will be questions and support for you. Now, you'll see questions in the same style as those in the exams and be able to unpick what they are actually asking, what needs to be included in your responses and how these should be structured. Then you'll be ready to do exactly the same in the actual exam. Now you can get all three papers that we've written for this year and all the video walkthroughs in our masterclass or you can use these topics as a starting point for your revision. Please remember to revise everything as these are just predictions. We don't have any additional information or know anything in advance of the exams. We have not seen the real papers. Okay, let's get started. So we know for paper three, issues and options in psychology, there are four sections in the paper that you need to complete. We've got issues and debates. Everyone answers this section and and the three optional topics that you have studied. Do not attempt, please, to answer questions from a topic that you've not studied. We'll go through each of these topics in this video, but make sure you just skip to the bits that you need. Use the timestamps for the bits that are relevant to you as well. So with section A, issues and debates in psychology, remember everyone will answer the questions in this section. First up, we've got determinism. Now you need to understand the debate between determinism, which argues that behaviour is controlled by internal or external forces and free will. Evaluate determinism by discussing its strengths, such as its contribution to scientific psychology by allowing for predictions and control as seen in drug therapies for mental disorders. However, also consider limitations such as the ethical implications of denying personal responsibility and the reduction of complex behaviours to simple causes. Next, we've got reductionism and reductionism breaks down complex behaviour into its simplest parts. Now, this can be seen in biological reductionism, for example, reducing mental illness to neurotransmitter imbalances and environmental reductionism, for example, explaining phobias through classical conditioning. Be prepared to evaluate reductionism, noting its strength in producing effective treatments like SSRIs for OCD, but also criticise it for oversimplifying behaviour, neglecting the interaction between different influences and reducing psychological phenomena to purely biological or a behavioural level. We also have the nature versus nurture debate. So understand the nature versus nurture debate, which examines whether genetics, nature or environment nurture has a greater influence on behavior. Twin studies are often used to support the genetic argument while behaviorist theories, such as Bandura's social learning theory, highlight the role of nurture. Evaluate this debate by considering the strengths of genetic research in understanding heritability, but also acknowledging the complexity of interactions between genes and the environment. We have socially sensitive research. Now, socially sensitive research refers to studies that could have social consequences, especially for participants or groups involved. Examples include research on intelligence and race or genetic predispositions to criminal behaviour. And finally, look at the nomothetic approaches. Nomothetic approaches seek to establish general laws of behaviour by studying large groups as seen in cognitive psychology and behaviourism. Evaluate this approach by discussing its strengths in creating objective scientific findings, but also criticise it for lacking depth and failing to account for individual differences. Contrast it with ideographic approaches which focus on in-depth case studies. Next, we have section B, relationships, gender and cognition and development. Now, remember, you just select one of the options and then answer all the questions within that option. Do not attempt to answer questions on a topic that you've not studied. You will not have enough knowledge or detail to be successful. So section B, option one is relationships and you should revise the absence of gating in virtual relationships. So understand the concept of gating where certain physical or social factors factors inhibit relationships forming in face-to-face -face interactions. In virtual relationships, these gates are absent, allowing individuals to disclose more personal information and form connections more easily. 
be ready to evaluate this concept with research such as McKenna and Brewer's findings on the strength of online relationships. Criticise it by discussing issues like deception and the potential lack of genuine interaction in virtual spaces as well. Look at the attachment theory explanation of parasocial relationships. Apply Bowlby's attachment theory to explain why individuals from parasocial relationships, and that's one-sided relationships with celebrities or fictional characters, those with insecure attachment types, particularly avoidant or anxious attachment styles, are more likely to form parasocial bonds as a way to avoid the rejection found in real life relationships. Evaluate this explanation by considering research supporting the link between attachment styles and parasocial relationships, but also discuss limitations, such as the over-reliance on attachment theory to explain all forms of parasocial behaviour. And then look at the equity theory of romantic relationships. Equity theory suggests that individuals are happiest in relationships where there is a balance of contributions and rewards. Inequity, where one partner feels they give more than they receive, can lead to dissatisfaction. Be prepared to evaluate equity theory by discussing its practical application in relationship counselling, but also criticise it for not accounting for cultural differences or individual variations on the perception of equity. Next, section B, option two, this is gender. You want to look at Turner's syndrome. Understand Turner's syndrome, a chromosomal disorder where females have only one X chromosome. This condition can affect physical development and behaviour, including characteristics such as short stature and difficulty with spatial tasks. Then look at psychodynamic explanations of gender development. So be familiar with Freud's psychodynamic explanation, particularly the Oedipus and Electra complexes, which suggests that gender identity is formed during the phallic stage around three to six years old as a result of resolving unconscious conflicts with the same sex parent. Evaluate this explanation by discussing its historical significance and the insights it provides into gender development. However, criticise it for its lack of empirical support, the overemphasis on unconscious processes and the outdated focus on traditional family structures. And finally, you want to look at social explanations for gender dysphoria. Social explanations for gender dysphoria focus on the role of societal and environmental factors, such as childhood experiences, in influencing feelings of gender incongruence. Examples include social reinforcement of gendered behaviours or childhood trauma. Be ready to evaluate these explanations by considering evidence from case studies and how social and cultural expectations of gender can contribute to dysphoria. Criticise these approaches for overlooking biological factors and failing to explain the experiences of all individuals with gender dysphoria. Section B, option three is cognition and development. You should explore class inclusion, Understand Piaget's concept of class inclusion, which is the ability to understand that objects can belong to multiple categories simultaneously. This cognitive ability usually develops during the concrete operational stage around age seven. Be prepared to evaluate Piaget's research on class inclusion by considering studies that support his stages of development, but also discuss alternative views. For example, Vygotsky's emphasis on social interaction in cognitive development. Then you'll also want to look at the theory of the mind. Now, the theory of the mind, or TOM, refers to the ability to understand that others have beliefs, desires and perspectives that are different from your own. This concept is often studied in the context of autism, where individuals may struggle to develop TOM. Now, evaluate research into TOM, such as Baron Cohen's work with the Salian task by discussing its significance in understanding social cognition, but also criticise it for the difficulty in measuring TOM and the variability in development among children. Finally, look at Bayajan's explanation of early infant abilities. Bayajan challenged Piaget's view that infants lack object permanence before eight months using more sensitive measures such as the violation of expectation paradigm. Her research shows that even young infants understand object permanence, suggesting more advanced cognitive abilities than Piaget proposed. Evaluate Bayajan's work by considering its methodological strengths and how it challenges traditional developmental theories. However, discuss limitations such as the assumption that infants' gaze reflects complex cognitive processes. Now, finally, we've got section C, schizophrenia, eating behaviour and stress. Remember, you just select one of these options, then answer all the questions within that option. Again, don't attempt to answer any questions on a topic that you've not studied. So first up in section C, we've got option one, schizophrenia. So you want to look at the interactionist approach and understand how both biological factors, for example, genetics and dopamine hypothesis and environmental influences, for example, stress and family dysfunction combine to explain schizophrenia. This model explains how genetic predisposition can be triggered by environmental stresses. 
and you'll also want to look at the reliability and validity in diagnosis and classification. Be prepared to evaluate the reliability and validity of diagnosing schizophrenia. Issues include inter-rater reliability where clinicians may disagree on diagnosis and validity concerns such as symptom overlap with other disorders including bipolar disorder. Section C option two is eating behaviour. You should explore genetic explanations of obesity. Focus on how genetic factors such as the role of the FTO gene contribute to obesity. Twin and adoption studies often demonstrate a heritable component, but it's important to evaluate the role of environments such as lifestyle and diet. You'll also want to brush up on success and failure of dieting. You need to understand psychological factors that contribute to why some diets succeed and others fail. Theories like the restraint theory explain how attempting to restrict food can paradoxically lead to overeating. Success is often associated with factors like realistic goal setting and long-term behavioral change. Now, finally, on section C, we've got option three, which is stress. You should revise individual differences. Recognise that stress responses vary significantly between individuals due to genetic, psychological and social factors. For example, personality traits such as type A behaviour are associated with higher stress levels and a greater risk of heart disease. In contrast, individuals with a type B personality may be more relaxed and less prone to stress. Now, finally, we've got section D, aggression, forensic psychology and addiction. Again, you're just selecting one of the options and answering all questions within your option. So option one in section D is aggression. You should look at the impact of media on aggression. Study how media exposure, particularly violent video games and TV shows, can influence aggressive behaviour. Research such as Bandura's social learning theory suggests that aggression can be learned through observation and imitation. However, this is contrasted by the catharsis theory, which argues that watching aggressive media might reduce the likelihood of aggressive behaviour by allowing a safe outlet for emotions. Evaluate the debate surrounding media violence, especially regarding its real world impact versus experimental findings. Option two in section D is forensic psychology. Focus on the top-down approach to offender profiling. Understand how the top-down approach is used in profiling serious offenders like serial killers. This approach involves categorising criminals into organised or disorganised based on crime scene analysis as developed by the FBI. Be prepared to critique this method by considering its reliance on intuition rather than empirical evidence as well as its limited application to non-violent crimes and varying crime types. Now finally we've got section D, option three, addiction. You want to look at cognitive theory of gambling addiction. The cognitive theory explains gambling addiction as driven by cognitive distortions such as the gambler's fallacy, the belief that past losses will influence future wins. Be prepared to discuss research support in this such as Griffith's study on fruit machine gamblers and evaluate the cognitive theory by considering its explanatory power alongside critiques that it may overlook biological and social factors that contribute to gambling addiction. And of course, as always, it's worth reminding you of research methods. Embrace research methods across all the papers. Recognise that research methods content appears in all of them, not just paper two. While paper two is where you will find the main section on research methods, it's crucial to understand that research methods knowledge can and is examined across the entire course. So familiarise yourself with examples of research and identify key elements such as aims, hypotheses, variables, control measures, samples used and data collected. Exposure to different research scenarios is going to better prepare you for a new piece of research you'll face in this section. Use resources such as our predictive papers and walkthroughs to obviously strengthen your understanding and application of research methods. Now, as always, good luck and please don't forget to let us know how you get on.